some of you might have classes and things right at the top of the hour. So I'm going to go ahead and um, get us moving so I can get you out of here on time. Can you guys all hear me okay? Yes. Thanks, Vaughn. All righty, guys. Okay, so let's take a look at how to engage your students um, the most effective way and inside of a Blackboard Learn Ultra course. Um, and record the session for those of you who are um, joining us later. And um, let's get started. So a lot of this is going to be on the slide deck itself, so you'll also have access to that. Um, but then if we have time and I can go out to a live course, I'll also do that as well. For those of you who were with me in the last session, you'll see some of that already there, um, some of the things that we talked about. So let's get moving. We're going to add a few features here today. We're not only going to talk about the Ultra course, um, but we'll talk about the Ultra course within the mobile environment, and we'll also talk about the Collaborate Room, which is what we're in right now. And when we're talking about um, student engagement, we're going to look at all of these different kinds of features that we have available to us. Um, so creative assessments and virtual office hours, that would be a collaborate thing that we could do, just like we're meeting here today, as well as synchronous lectures. The ability to talk one-on-one -on -one with your students, the ability to talk in a group of students um, and do all that differently. We also can look at group projects in both the Ultra course itself and here inside of the Collaborate Room, uh, where you can do group projects there as well and have group sidebar conversations. It's also a great way to break out a student out of an office hour if there's multiple students in there and they have a private question they want to ask you. You can break that one student off into a collaborate room, a, a group room, and um, nobody else can hear or see or listen in on whatever's happening there. So it could be a very private conversation and then you can rejoin the rest of the group later. So there's a number of things we can do there. We're also going to talk about different ways of assessing your students and let's be a little creative um, with how we do that and how we can utilize some of those tools specifically for engagement and maybe not necessarily as a graded assessment like a discussion board uh, but certainly ways that we can do both and we'll talk about other ways like with class conversations um, again one of my favorite tools where you can have a conversation about a certain item in a course um, that's also a great way to engage your students we're going to talk about a number of different facets of conversation uh, about engagement, um, stemming from everything about the instruction itself and different kinds of tools that we can work with there for the instruction um, through learner engagement and how stu students and learners can engage with each other, with you, and with the content itself. So a number of ways that we can get access to information and how we can load that information into our courses, a matter of course management when it comes to effectively um, saving off the information that you want to reuse potentially in other courses by way of the content collection or through your cloud drives, and the use of portfolios, uh, an underused tool that is wonderful if you have a lockstep program or if you have a program that has um, a final, um, like a, a capstone project at the very end and you want to assess different learning throughout different levels of your degree program, the portfolio lives with the student and not with the course or any course. It's with the students. So it's a great way to assess progress in a particular program. And then also that kind of ties into accreditation and assessments um, here for the institution and programmatically as you can utilize the portfolios as a means of assessing the outcome and the um, efficiency and the uh, success of a program and to also show for accreditation purposes as well. There's also a lot of analytics built into the ultra course, um, none of which I have time to cover today, unfortunately, but certainly things that we could send you more information on later if you're interested because there are course based analytics that allow you to see the success of maybe um, let's say some of the assessments that you build or question by question analysis as to how well those questions have um, been received by the students. Um, if everybody has failed on one particular uh, question, let's just say in a test, you might want to take a look at that one question and maybe restructure the way that question has been stated to see if maybe it's just not asked you very well, you know. 
So let's take a look inside that course itself and think about a couple of the tools that are made available here. One is Class Conversations. Um, You'll probably already heard me talk about that, but it's a, one of my favorites. Um, discussion boards that I think sometimes get a little bit of a bad rap. Um, so there's ways we can look at discussion boards and also journals. Journals is a very private exchange between student and instructor, but can be used in a number of different ways for engagement um, that we'll talk about here in a second. So let's start with discussion boards. Now, it's a great way to have an assessment, and a lot of people want it just for the sake that they know they're talking back and forth with other students in their class. However, I also like using discussion boards as a non-graded item. Um, you can put in a conversation for the discussion topic, and you can see responses down below. You also can witness how many participants of the class have actually contributed so far. Um, and look at how many times they've also responded. So it becomes a lot easier to look at um, the discussion board, whether it is graded or ungraded, because you can see how many people have participated and who might yet need to participate. Um, so it's certainly a really great tool to use. Um, again, it, this can be the engagement with student to student, student to instructor, and student to content, because in the discussion board, you also can add media. Right, so we can look at different benefits of this. We can have different mediums here for collaboration. We can look to demonstrate understanding or application by use of maybe a video. We also can have a record of that discussion. So obviously anything with the discussion board is saved in the course itself. So there's always that record of communication and of participation and contribution. And the cool thing about a discussion board, I think, too, is there's there's no back row. Nobody can hide in the discussion board, right? Um, so people are always up front. They're always there. There is always a requirement to participate if it is a graded um, discussion board. So it's really a wonderful way to seek kind of that open-ended, thought-provoking, higher-level learning um, option. And to show um, specific guidelines and length format. I am a big advocate for using rubrics when you're doing a discussion for grading uh, because you can be very transparent with your students as to what the requirements are. Um, you know, a post of, hey, that's a really cool post, I completely agree with you. That might be a nice comment to make to somebody, but sure probably isn't going to count as a formal response back to the student for credit, right? Um, so you want to make those very clear to your students and make sure that they understand what those requirements are in their responses in order to receive credit um, where credit is due. Um, you also can have class conversations. Now, they operate a lot the same way of a discussion board in that it does allow for inter um, interaction between the student and the between students between the student and the instructor and again between student and content which is super important and I think um, understated sometimes but you can have conversations for any of these content items here a class conversation is very simple to do um, if you look down here at the bottom right hand side it is a check mark right so when you are building an assessment of any type you have the ability or actually a, a document or anything you have this option to check mark uh, to allow class conversations. It's very easy. It's a toggle switch. Excuse me. When you toggle that, um, then it does allow this new um, icon to pop up, um, which we'll see here. It'll be, it would be up in the top right hand corner. And that becomes your conversations icon. And you can sit there and have a conversation back and forth, students especially. Think about if you have a document that you're handing out in class face-to-face -face class, um, and maybe it's a reading assignment, maybe it's an article that you're handing out to them, or a study guide, and students will turn to each other and they'll start talking most of the time about that document. Um, and when that happens, it's, a, it's, it's nice because they are starting to engage with each other, they're engaging with the content, they're asking questions, and that replicates the exact same thing here, but in the virtual environment. So I think it's a really great way to assess, not assess, I'm sorry, to engage your students um, back and forth. Now, areas where you may not want to use a class conversation, you know, maybe not in a test or a group test, but that being said, I'm okay with assignment sometimes, depending on the assignment. Um, I'm okay with them asking each other questions about that. They're going to do it anyway on their phones or whatever else, right? So I think it's nice to have it in an open area where you get to see what they're asking as well and can perhaps help out if need be. 
The class conversations is really cool because it is also um, a visual indicator. It, there's a little purple button that will show up. So anytime you have a class conversation turned on and there is something that needs to be read or should be read, it will be indicated here with a little bit of ultra purple. Um, so you have a little dot here next to the icon for conversation and in the course content itself, you will also have a dot here indicating that there is a message. Um, and again, as the instructor, you don't have to participate in class conversations. I think it's kind of nice so they know you're there. Um, in case they say something they shouldn't say, <laughs> there is a monitor. Um, but it's really a great tool for students to engage with each other. Um, as it works out, again, it looks a lot like a discussion board. So as I zoom in on this, and by the way, if you double click anywhere in the middle of your screen, that will zoom in for you as well. So we want to see things a little bit closer and in person. Um, I love the feature on the right hand side and this happens in the discussion board as well as here in class conversations and that tells me exactly who has contributed and how many times they have contributed. I think that's super important um, and a very easy way to get a glimpse of who has participated so far and who has yet to say anything. Um, now in a class conversation, again, this isn't graded, so there's no requirement for participation, but it's kind of nice to see who's the most engaged. Um, you'll also notice that right next to Michael's name, just a little sidebar that I like to bring out to you, um, next to Michael there's a little purple badge. <clears throat> that badge uh, is an indicator that he has an accommodation listed in the course. Um, now you would have set that accommodation, but let's say it's, you know, week 12 of the semester, you forgot already um, what his accommodation is. You can click on that badge at any time and see what Michael's accommodation is set for. You are the only one that will see this badge. Students will not see this. So as a student comes into the class conversation um, and they have, they're in their view, the student view, it will just say Michael Donovan. It will not have that purple badge there. So you don't need to worry about that anymore. As you go through, you actually can, as the instructor, um, if need be, censor anybody's post. So if you needed to take out, uh, you know, God forbid there was like a swear word or something in there, um, you could certainly do that. Or if it was a really just inappropriate post altogether, you certainly could delete it and obviously address that um, privately with the student if that was necessary. Um, hopefully it never will be necessary, but it is nice to know that that's available there if you do need it. So the journal is a lot like any kind of journal you would have sitting on your nightstand at home um, growing up, right? Um, or even as an adult. It is self-reflective, it is a private space. It allows students to think about things and um, kind of reflect back on their learning process. It certainly is a great way to do a reflective essay at the end of a term. That's a very popular tool and assessment to use in a fully online class. Um, the reflective learning though is supposed to be informative, not only as the student is informing you of their learning process, but also it can serve as a way to inform you on how the class was received by the student. I love learn, a learning journal um, specifically for that purpose. So a lot of times, depending on the topic I'm teaching, I like to create a journal that is ungraded. I want it to be a safe space for the students to be able to post something if they have a question for me. Uh, perhaps they can't get to my office hour and there's something they want to discuss with me. I know that this is a safe place where they can do that. And I also want them to give me feedback, um, sort of like a, a, a free zone of comments about how the course is going, what's working. You know, everybody does an end of term evaluation, a course evaluation, but sometimes you want a little more um, evidence as to what it is going on in the course that is good or maybe does need some work. And it's funny because even though um, this happens and you you know it's not um, anonymous, students are really happy to give that kind of feedback, positive and you know if necessary negative. So um, it's just something you might want to consider doing as a different kind of option for the journal. Another great way to engage students is through group work. And again, you can do this in two different ways when it comes to the Ultra Classroom, if you have Collaborate, which Cape Fear does, and that is to bring students together in groups both inside the Ultra Classroom and if you are separately doing something in Collaborate, you can break them out into Collaborate groups. Again, in, a, um, in either one of these settings, they have private areas where they can collaborate together. 
Um, in the groups itself for an ultra course, students can do a number of things. There's a great reason why we do group work, right? Even though most students hate it, um, I know I used to moan about it myself, but um, it really is wonderful when they get out into the real world, so to speak, and they get a job. It's amazing. You have to work in teams, right? So it's a really good benefit for the student. Um, it helps them kind of take different roles in their learning process. It allows somebody to step up as leader or there could be co-leaders in a different kind of group project. Um, it can establish good relationships and make people accountable, right? Without it being the teacher, and, you know, e they keep each other accountable. Um, there is a great way to do this from inside an ultra course, super easy to do. In your details and actions on the left-hand side of your course will be course groups. You literally just can click on there. You can create group sets, which could be like major group headings, if you will, and then separate groups underneath those group sets. Um, and you can also create the group right from an assessment that you're creating. So if you don't do this ahead of time, you absolutely can add it in as you are creating the group project or whatever it is that you're working on. You also can do group discussions. And again, you can do that the same kind of way. You can assign this out to certain groups if you are working on group discussions. I know I've used this a lot. Um, I like doing group discussions. It kind of makes the discussion back and forth just a little bit more intimate and smaller. Um, so that's a, certainly a great use of groups as well. And like we are doing here in Collaborate, you can also do breakout groups there. When you do a group inside of an ultra course, every one of those groups gets their own Collaborate room automatically. And again, that's a place that is private to them. It is something that they can have a conversation. They don't need to worry about people intervening. They can have um, shared documents. They can use a whiteboard. They really can collaborate in a synchronous fashion that, in that way through the ultra course itself. Once you go into the group um, discussion, a lot of the fears, and if you double click in the center there, guys, to take a look at this a little closer, one of the fears, of course, one person does all the work, right? That's what I always used to hear when I was teaching. And this is great because it gives you um, an equity balance here of analytic data that you can see about what's happening in the group. Right away on the left hand side, I can see there's only four active students out of six in this particular group. I can see how much content they've actually posted per person as an average. And if I go down through here and click on each one of these students, whoops, these students down here who have participated, I can see exactly how many things they've contributed to, the word count, how many you know words they've actually typed into the actual document, and I get to see those students who haven't already participated and I can contact them right away here and message them from within the classroom and ask them, hey, you really need to start getting involved in your group work, um, get a move on. <laughs> so I can absolutely do that as well and um, that becomes a really great tool. Um, as you look here, again, this is where you would find this information in the assignment settings itself. So as you are creating an assignment, you'll see it grayed out in the background here. Uh, as you go down to do your grading, you could, again, check mark off um, your class conversations if you wanted to do that. You also can collect submissions offline if you needed to do that as well. And as I come down most of the way to the bottom, that is where you would be able to assign a group. And over here, you would click to assign to groups and you could pick all the different groups that you have created and um, have them break out into their group activity. Now, one other thing I want to do real quick, uh, because we are in Collaborate and we have seven people in our room right now, for just a second, I'm going to break us all out into groups because I want you to see what that would look like. So I'm going to randomly assign you all. It's probably going to be a breakout of four and three. Actually, it is four and three. Um, actually, I'm going to put myself in the main room and move one person to a different group. So it's three and three. There we go. All right, so I'm going to break us out into groups very quickly, and then I'm going to bring us all back to the pool, the main pool here. So I just want you to see that you have the ability groups to do things.
Okay, jump on the mic. What did you guys think? Was it nice to be able to just have your own little room there? Okay. All right, so let's keep it, keep on moving here. Um, we wanted to also look at the ways that we can change up and engage our students with the content for our assessments. Yeah, Adam, I agree. It's very cool to do with a large group. We do it all the time here at work, actually. So um, it's actually very useful. Okay, um, so another way that we can kind of engage students and kind of think a little bit outside the box when it comes to assessments is to include media. That's certainly a really easy thing to do. Um, depending on your discipline and your topic, I was actually working with one of your colleagues here in our room um, at 9 o'clock, 9.30 this morning, and she had a ton of different images in her tests. So in her assessments themselves, per question, she utilized an image like you see here. It wasn't a person. It was a sonogram, actually. Um, but it was great because you were able to put in a, an image, um, perhaps it's a map and you have an arrow pointing to a certain country and you're asking what country is this or, you know, whatever it might happen to be. But it's a really great way of supplementing your assessments and allowing students to engage a little bit more with the content itself. Um, with online learning, it just promotes that use of um, different kinds of learning styles. Uh, if you're a visual learner, tactical learner, um, you know, kind of static where you have to click on things. Um, so there's just other ways to kind of um, breach those options. Now let's talk about the mobile app. Now even if you don't already use the mobile app, I'm pretty sure your students probably are. Um, I have two kids that attend Blackboard schools and they both use theirs all the time. Um, and it's free, right? So any kind of app that's free is a good app. Um, so <laughs> Not necessarily, I know. Um, but you have your own app, right? As the instructor, you have a Blackboard instructor app that, again, you can download for free. You would use your Cape Fear credentials to log into that particular app. And your students have their student app. And I love the use of the app because um, you can access all your course material right from there for your students <clears throat> with um, your virtual office hours. You literally can do them on your phone if you're out and about and you can't be in your your physical office or if, Lord forbid, you know, the college closes down again because of COVID or whatever else, a hurricane, <clears throat> you can still reach out to your students on the mobile app and do virtual office hours on Collaborate through your phone. It's, it's fantastic. But let's think about how we can utilize mobile technology as not necessarily a disruptive technology, but one that is has value inside the classroom. Um, and that's when we kind of look at that flipped classroom model. So I love this example. I was at a school in Norway, actually, and with the instructor that was in there, he taught architecture. Um, and then there was another faculty member in the room who was a civil engineer. And they worked together on a project where they had their students go out into the town, into the city that we were in, and they would take different kinds of pictures both architecturally, how are things looking, how are things structured, and then from the civil engineering perspective with bridges and roads, where are some of the things in our town that we maybe could um, engage a project with the, um, with the town members themselves, um, the, the uh, government of the town, and think about different ways we can improve things. So they went out, had their students take pictures with their phones, or some of them did videos, they came back into the classroom, the physical classroom then, and shared that content. You can even do that in a discussion board. You could have students go outside the virtual classroom, do that same kind of project, maybe do an interview with somebody like that, where they can utilize the recording of their phone or pick photos, photos in their phone, come back to a discussion board, post those in the discussion board, and have people be able to listen in on the interview or to look at different pictures or a picture slideshow. Um, all of that could, could happen in there. And it's a really fun way to promote different kinds of learning, right? So it's a really good way of incorporating mobile technology. Now, we already just talked about. So again, we have the Blackboard app for students, the instructor app for you. And as I double click on this, or as you do to enlarge this, you will see that it even allows for grading in them mobile environment um, and you can do audio grading 
um, you can annotate different things, you can post the grades, you can you know, do all of that from the app if you wish to do so. It's good as an alternative to your desktop or laptop computer if you know you need it, right? I used to use the app all the time to do an announcement, for instance. If there was something I forgot to tell my students um, and I was on the go and I didn't have my laptop with me, I'd be like, oh my gosh, I forgot to tell them this, to the app, put in an announcement very quickly and push it out to the class. Super easy to do and it made my life a little less stressful. There are also some native tools that are available within a mobile device that you want to encourage your students to think about using. And one of those is just the ability to, again, host flexible and virtual office hours. So that is something that you may want to think about doing through Collaborate um, for your students. You can encourage them to attend. Um, if they are even at work and they only have a 10 minute break and they needed to ask you a question, if they could break out at that time and do that, that's a fabulous thing. Um, they could join the sessions right from the app. They also can join it straight from Collaborate um, itself in a browser. Um, so that's another way that they can do that. Um, and certainly for you, you can offer those um, virtual office hours and do it the same way. You can be on the go um, and using your phone for things too. So fantastic. You also can have students think about doing push notifications for different things. One of those will be to set a deadline reminder. If you have um, an upcoming assignment that's due, they can take advantage of the activity stream that you see in base navigation when you are logging into your classes and you have that left side navigation for ultra base navigation there, exact same setup in the mobile environment. So they're already familiar with that navigation. That like navigation promotes the clarity of the system and they can set up push notifications there for their app. There's nothing better than getting an announcement or a, a alert on your phone to tell you that you have to do something because you forgot about it, right? <laughs> um, and the nice thing is that it interacts with the system. So if that does happen, they can click on that notification and it will take them into the system and into the app itself to look at the course content. Again, we already kind of talked about this in my example of that um, civil engineer project that um, they did and that particular course I was helping out with. But you also can think of a number of different ways to, again, utilize a mobile device for people. So again, looking at on-camera interviews or even um, audio-only interviews that you may have with students. Um, you may want to consider a digital storytelling project. I did a virtual tour once in a course because a lot of the students couldn't physically go to the location of where I wanted them to see this particular tour. So we did a virtual tour, had a camera, used our cell phones, did a walking tour of the area and brought that back and was able to tie that together to a little storytelling project for the students. So again, a super cool way of using mobile technology. Um, if you do anything with field work, biology, um, if you um, are maybe in the arts, so maybe um, if you're able to record uh, a music performance or if you're able to go through a museum and take photos only with your camera without the flash, um, something to that effect, and you can share that then, share those experiences with your classmates. How super cool is that, right? So really an, uh, just another way that you can leverage those mobile tools. And then again with Collaborate, um, certainly some things we can think about and we've already kind of mentioned some of these, but the synchronous lectures and synchronous office hours are absolutely I think vital for success in an online classroom, especially a fully online classroom. So providing FaceTime with your students, and that doesn't even have to be necessarily live FaceTime. You could do this asynchronously too, but it's so much nicer, especially now with Collaborate and being able to see multiple people at one time. Um, you can hold those live sessions and really chit chat and talk back and forth with your students um, or see if they fell asleep in the classroom like they would be doing in the face-to-face -face classroom anyway. <laughs> um, I only laugh about that because it happened with one of my, um, my, my son's uh, classes in high school. <laughs> um, and the other great thing, and I do this a lot too, is to record lectures with or without your students in the room. Now, right now, I have students in my room, so to speak. You are now the student as the instructor. Um, and we're recording the session. So this is a live, can be synchronous conversation back and forth. Um, and it is being recorded so that people can look at it later. 
But a lot of times I will do a lecture recording without anyone in the room with me. So the ability to perhaps do a first walkthrough of the course environment, um, just like you would do in a face-to-face -face classroom, walk through the syllabus with them, record yourself doing that, pull up the syllabus and share it here on the screen and literally section by section. I've done that a lot of times and I will post that in my um, introduction to the students in my getting started folder and students love it. They love the idea that they initially can hear your voice, they see you, they have a face um, to put with the name and a voice to put with the name. Um, it's just a really great way to initially engage your students in a fully online classroom. To access Collaborate from within your learn environment, so within your Learn Ultra course, it's super easy to do. It's not hidden in any tools menu or anything else anymore. It is right here on the left-hand side under Details and Actions, and it will say Blackboard Collaborate and Join Session. That join session is your course room. So that is your virtual for this particular course. Now there is also a drop down menu there and that drop down menu provides to you a number of other management um, features that students won't have, but you will have. Um, another way that you can engage your students in the classroom is just like if you were face to face and you asked a class for, um, you know, in front of the students and they raise their hands to answer. You usually raise their hand first and call on them first, just out of courtesy, right? And this is no different. So um, if any of you would please raise your hand, bottom center of your screen, just go ahead and click on the raise hand button. Looks like that little silhouette with our arm in the hair, arm in the air. Um, you will see, <coughs> excuse me, in the bottom right hand corner where there's a double arrow, please click on that and then go to the attendees panel. It looks like two other silhouettes there on the screen. When you do that, you're gonna see Jennifer and Adam have both raised their hand. And everything is in alphabetical order by first name. So Adam is already in first place there, but Jennifer isn't, right? So as soon as Jennifer raised her hand, it moved her to that top position. And if um, anybody else raised their hand, um, Don or Jamie or anybody else maybe, They didn't raise their hand. Okay, I was thinking if they could raise their hand. Sorry. Oh, oh, uh, hold on. That's okay. <laughs> All I wanted to say is that, thank you. <laughs> it will put everybody right. So um, let's say Deborah, you raised your hand first, and then uh, Frau Shin, you raised your hand second, and then Adam it would put you in order as to who hit their button first. So it's awesome as the instructor because then you can call on people in order, just like you would do in the classroom. Um, captions are coming fairly soon, Adam. Um, Coleman, have you heard by chance? Captioning on Collaborate. I think it's in the next six months, but because I know they're in a pilot right now and it, the pilot I heard is going very well. So the auto captioning is coming pretty soon. Um, Okay, so that's one other feature you can use in the live classroom. And the other thing, uh, this is just kind of more of a fun thing and a very quick way to kind of engage and just get the temperature of the room. If you're asking a question, you'll notice in the bottom left-hand side of where your hand raising is, the far left, it has my status and settings. And when you click on that, it gives you a pop-up menu. And if I ask you guys, hey, how are you feeling today? you can go ahead and answer feedback with one of those little emoticons. So if you could do a happy face, a sad face, a confused face, um, whatever you might want to add. And if you look in that attendees panel on the right again, like I mentioned, you'll see Adam and I are happy people today. We have a little happy. That indicator will stay there for 30 seconds. So you can get a very quick review as to who's doing well in the class, or perhaps you ask a question and you can be like, um, if you've just gone over a pretty extensive, uh, let's say a description of something for your for your class topic of the day, and you can just ask the class, hey, are you guys good? Do you understand what I'm talking about? They can give you an agree or a disagree very quickly in that panel, and you as the instructor get to do a really quick review on the right-hand side and take a look, and you hopefully see a bunch of green check marks. But there could be an instance where somebody doesn't understand um, and you need to see the red one and you can then ask that person 
Um, are you sure you're doing okay? You know, what can I explain better? Whatever might happen to be. There is also a way to mark out if you're away from your mic for a minute and to let them know. So you can just go ahead and click away and it will tell people that you've stepped away for a second to do whatever you needed to do. And as soon as you come back, you can indicate that as well. Adam just indicated that he's gone for a second and he'll be coming back to the room hopefully soon. There he is. Um, so again, it's all in real time and it's really effective when it comes to organizing a synchronous classroom. The other thing I like to use a lot, and I mentioned this yesterday, my kids tell me I use these too much probably, but I don't care because I like them, is the use of the emoticons. So when you go into your chat panel, um, you can see the little happy face emoticon there. And when you click on it, you actually have the ability right here to type in a subject. So maybe you're looking for a dog or a cat or um, the sun because you want to see that it's sunny outside or a cloud because it's raining or an umbrella. You can type in those words in the search for emojis. Go ahead. Um, I see people are adding stuff in, which I love. Ooh, an owl. Very nice, Jennifer. Um, so you can go in there and you know do that all the time. If something makes you laugh and you're literally laughing out loud in your home or wherever it is you're having your um, synchronous communication. <laughs> Adam, what is that? Is that a poodle? It's a poodle. <laughs> um, you absolutely can do that. Um, and I think it's great. It makes me laugh all the time. It makes me happy. I like the engagement. I know here at work, when we have four or 500 people in a room at one time, we'll start populating things if we think something's funny or silly, or if we need help with something, um, you know, you can do that too. You can always give a thumbs up. Um, you can give a nice little <clears throat> um, metal rock and roll uh, symbol, which I like to use sometimes. So, you know, just fun things that you can do to keep your students engaged. Another really great tool is the polls tool. So polling is here in Collaborate. You can create either multiple choice polls or you can do yes or no choices. Um, so I can come in here and just say, you don't, you don't have to answer honestly if you don't want to right now, but I'm just gonna say, um, was the session helpful? I'm gonna type it in very quickly. Um, you can hit start to do the poll and now you're gonna see it on your screen and you can answer however you wanna answer. And as a um, moderator, as the person in charge of this session itself, you get to see what everybody is answering. There will be a Y or an N next to your names in that panel, the attendees panel. You can't see it right now, but like Jennifer can because she's a moderator. Um, and then you can show the responses to the constituents. So you hit show responses and now you guys can see how many people have said yes, how many people have said no. And it's a nice little way to, again, engage your learners with the content and to keep them just kind of on their toes. Um, you know, let's be really honest, doing anything virtually all the time, especially during the pandemic or in a 100% uh, online course, it can get kind of tiring. Your brain gets a little tired, right, to just sit here and listen to people talk all the time in a flat format, 2D fashion computer screen. So. Being able to engage them with the content itself, I think is super helpful. And again, it just lightens things up. It makes things a little happier and a little more fun to learn. <clears throat> Another thing that we're gonna do, and we're gonna test this one out right now, is the use of a whiteboard. So I want you to go ahead in the top left-hand side of your screen, there are some annotation tools that are available to you there. A pencil tool, a text tool, a shape tool. And I want you to go ahead and pick a color um, and you can just start writing. So let's see how good I can do my cursive handwriting there. But you should be able to go in here and do whatever you want. Um, grab the text tool, grab um, a square, a rectangle. You can write, you can draw things, you can take the arrow and move things around and make them bigger or smaller by grabbing the corners of them. You even can click on one thing at a time with that arrow tool and hit the delete button. Um, I wouldn't do that trash can on the top right because that will everything. Um, but if you click on individual things with that arrow tool, you can delete them one at a time. <clears throat> and this is super fun too because even on those pr uh, presentation slides I was showing you earlier, you can write on those as well. You saw me do that a couple times. I took my blue pen and I was drawing and circling some things and pointing some things out. 
you can have students do the same thing. So let's say I have a picture and I want to put up a map of the world or a map of North Carolina. And you could say, <clears throat> so where are you guys actually from? Where are you from? Where do you live? You can bring up that map and students can put a little circle where they live or a little dot or you know, draw an arrow to it. It's just a nice way to engage everybody. Um, so that's certainly a fun way that you can do it as well. All right, I'm going to go back to the slide deck. Whoops, hit the wrong button. Okay, where are we? <clears throat> there we are. Um, and the other thing I like about this, you guys, too, is that with the annotation that happens, and you can, again, keep drawing on here if you want to. It doesn't bother me at all just to keep practicing. Um, but, like, if I wanted to show you something and draw an arrow, I can do that. Um, if I want to circle something, I can do that. And you guys could write on here, too, if you wanted to. Um, it's cool because as I'm doing this, it's still recording. So it will record all that annotation. So as I'm lecturing, if you do have a, a slide deck up here and you are annotating as you are talking, those actions are also recorded. So when people are viewing that presentation later and you're referencing something that you drew an arrow to, they'll see all that. So it doesn't go away. By the way, it also records everything happening in the chat. So as you are talking and referencing any kind of communication in that chat window, it will pop up on screen as people are watching that recording, um, and it will it will show on the screen exactly when somebody would have typed it initially in the live presentation. So that's pretty nice. It follows along with the timing of the presentation itself. So let's talk about some of the things we talked about today. We mentioned class conversations. Again, that is the ability to have a non-graded conversation back and forth with students between students and instructor and the student and the content itself. And we also talked about different ways that we can engage students with our journals and get some feedback from them and have a nice safe place for them to communicate with you. And the use of discussion boards both as an assessing, um, an assessment tool and also as a free tool just for conversation that it's not graded. Um, and we talked about having class conversations on for many different items. You can do it for a group project. You can have it turned on for a document that you created, your syllabus, any kind of start here information. Um, so all of those are very useful for class conversations. We also talked a little bit about engaging um, your assessments and amping them up a little bit with media. But we also talked a little bit about how to create some out of the box assessments by incorporating the use of mobile. Right, so we talked about um, not only using native features of a mobile device to keep students informed and to get push notifications and ways of keeping them engaged with the content of the course, but also how to use mobile um, and a mobile device for um, a, a really great tool outside the classroom that can then bring information into the classroom. We also communicated today about the use of groups. And as much as students maybe don't like them all the time, we can see in ultra courses how easy it is to determine if somebody is actually participating in a group or they're not. It's really easy to gauge that. You don't have to take the student's word for it anymore. As we have face-to-face -face classes, students get broken out into groups. It's a he said, she said, you know, conversation. They can say, um, well, you know, I did all the talking you know, this particular student A, I did all the talking. And it's really their word against everybody else's. In the working groups and on the ultra course, you get to see exactly who's communicated and who's not communicated. And you can actually intervene and ask those who have not yet participated to get on board. So it's a really good use of learning how to collaborate into groups um, and be a team player. Um, and then lastly, we talked about Collaborate itself, the tool Collaborate, and how we can use that to do both synchronous and asynchronous instruction with our students. With synchronous, clearly a synchronous lecture. Um, if you have that ability for students to join you in a synchronous lecture, that's fantastic. But it also could be synchronous virtual office hours where students can get help from you. You can do a study group, uh, a volunteer study group. Perhaps you want to do a Friday night study group and you want to do it via Collaborate. Students are out and about and they want to take a half hour to come in in that study group and study with you or to ask a question, they can do that because they can use their mobile device. 
You also can utilize your classroom as a recording studio. You can go into your classroom, open up your Collaborate room, go through, through the next project, go through the navigation of the course itself, talk about um, some things that you've maybe added there, maybe walk through an article, anything like that that you can do and record for the students and post that to your class content. Students will really love and appreciate. They like the idea of hearing your voice, um, whether they see you or not, even just hearing your voice is a big, huge plus. Um, so certainly brings a lot of personalization to what is generally void of interpersonal communication in an online environment. So certainly some other things that you can do.